And welcome back to EDH Deck Building. I am your host, Demo, and this is Brewing with Underwhelming Commanders, episode 26. And this is a, a little bit of an interesting one. I, I sort of got hacked or spammed or, or whatever you want to call it. The poll that I use, you're allowed to vote once a day on it, but I have a sneaky suspicion that someone found a way around that. I, I checked the poll the one day and saw who the top three vote getters were so that I could start working on the decks. But I thought I leave it one more day. I go back the next day and Tetsuo Umazawa goes from third place skyrockets into first place and I mean like quadruple the votes. I looked into it and sure enough it got 450 some votes in like a two hour period. Uh, so obviously there's someone out there that really badly wants to see Tetsuo Umazawa and somehow figured a way to sort of spam the poll. I'm not going to indulge this person completely but I will give Tetsuo Umazawa the third place even though I think there was some chicanery here going on. I'm essentially going to leave it the way it was when and I checked it the day before. So Tetsuo Umazawa is our number three commander this week. So what are you going to do with it? Well, it's blue, black, and a red. Human Archer 3-3. Can't be the target of aura spells. And that, this is kind of a weird thing that a lot of these old legendary creatures have, which actually is kind of relevant. I mean, obviously you can't cast any auras on your own commander. That's fine. That's usually not an issue. However, also your opponent can't cast an Imprisoned in the Moon on it or Song of the Dryads, right? So there is some nice advantage there. And particularly in Grixis, Grixis doesn't deal with enchantments very well, right? Hardly at all, in fact. So someone casting a Song of the Dryads on your commander can can really screw you. So that ability actually is kind of an advantage there. More so though, of course, we want to build around the second ability, blue, black, black, and red. Tap, destroy target, tapped or blocking creature. Now four mana and, and all colored mana too. That's not something that you're going to be wanting to do constantly, but you are going to be wanting to do it from time to time. And the one thing that you absolutely want to do in this deck, because our commander has a tap ability and wants to destroy tapped creatures, Having stuff that both taps and untaps is fantastic. So Fate Stitcher is the best option here. Obviously you can just tap it to tap or untap. So we can use this to untap our commander if we want to use it again, or more likely we're going to tap our opponent's creature with our Fate Stitcher so that we can then kill it with our commander. Fate Stitcher is far and away the best option here, but you could also use Captain of the Mists, which costs one and a blue and taps to tap or untap target permanent. I don't like to have to pay the mana because our commander already is mana intensive, but it is an option. Curse of Inertia is another one that you could use. It's actually a curse. And whenever a player attacks enchanted player with one or more creatures, that attacking player may tap or untap target permanent of his or her choice. So again, we can just attack them, tap one of their creatures, and then kill it with our commander, or we can use it to untap one of our things if we want to. Disciple of the Ring is another option for repeatedly untapping and tapping stuff. And because we're doing a lot of that, Verity Circle works here, right? Whenever a creature an opponent controls becomes tap, if it isn't being declared as an attacker, you may draw a card and also has pay four and a blue tap target creature with flying. So the second ability works great there too, because we can use it to tap down creatures. Again, it's mana intensive. It's not ideal. More so, I would want this in a Tetsuo deck for that first ability. Whenever you're tapping those creatures down, now you get to draw a card. So added advantage. We get to draw a card, then we kill their creature. A absolute must here though is Illusionist Bracers and Battle Mages Bracers. Again, we have a very mana intensive ability on our commander. So getting an added copied ability out of it is going to be great. I would also throw a few more tapping creatures in the deck. Arcanus the Omnipotent, Royal Assassin's a great one. That's certainly going to fit with what we're doing. And again, creatures that have really good tap abilities that we can be untapping with all our untap stuff, but also ones that aren't mana intensive, right? We want stuff that we can just tap, get something out of it, and then possibly untap it, use that ability again. Dulcet Sirens and Sly Instigator, also great ones. Only one blue to activate their abilities, but they're just great tap abilities that we can possibly use twice in a single turn. So that's the way I would go. I wouldn't go entirely. I'm trying to tap down my opponent's creatures to destroy them. That's why I like the tap and untap abilities so that we can just put a bunch of tap creatures in our deck and untap them to use their abilities again. And, you know, that destroy blocking creature also works here. If you're goading with your Dulcet Sirens, doesn't work with the Sly Instigator, obviously, because that creature is unblockable. But with the Dulcet Sirens, we can pick an opponent's creature. It has to attack. It's likely going to get blocked. 
And then we can use our commander's ability to kill the blocking creature if we want to. Invasion plans also works great here for that reason, right? Because creatures block each turn if able. So now we're going to be forcing blocks. So now we get to pick which creature we want to destroy again. Another thing you could do because you are killing blocking creatures. And I talked about this in my last 10 deck ideas video. You can put cards in there like Drelnok and Saprazan Air that want to be blocked, right? When Drelnok gets blocked, we get to draw two cards. When Saprazan Air gets blocked, we get to draw three cards. You have to make sure they get blocked. So maybe you have your invasion plans out or something like that. What you can do though, because all these creatures care about is blocking. Once they're blocked with your commander, you can destroy target blocking creature. So now your sappers and air isn't going to die, right? After blockers are declared, you get that trigger. You get to draw three cards. And then before the damage step, you can pay the four from your commander and kill the creature that is blocking your sappers and air before it takes any damage. So you don't have to worry about losing it. Another neat little thing you can do with Tetsuo Umazawa. So there you go, whoever was spamming the poll, you, at least I gave you something to work with. You'll have to do the rest of yourself, I'm afraid. But moving on to number two, and it is Thrasta Tempest Roar. And this is another one that I've had quite a few requests from people to do it in my Underwhelming Commanders videos or just a deck tech in general. And it's definitely an interesting one for sure that I think a lot of people aren't sure what direction to go with. So 10 green green, 12 mana, 7-7, seven, seven, but this spell costs three less to cast for each other spell cast this turn. So obviously if you cast one spell, it's going to be seven green green. So it's going to be nine mana. That's still really bad. But it also has trample and haste. It has trample over planeswalkers, which is kind of interesting. Not sure how often you're going to use it, but it is an, a nice little added bonus. And it has hexproof as long as it entered the battlefield this turn. So you could build a deck that isn't a Voltron deck with this. I, I think probably you just want to build a Voltron deck with it though. That's probably the best way to go here. You get it out. It's got trample and haste. You can attack right away. It even has hex proof the first time it hits the battlefield, which is pretty good. So you don't have to worry about protecting it right when it hits the table. However, I thought an interesting thing to do here, right? This spell costs three less to cast for each other spell cast this turn. That doesn't have to be your spells, right? That's the one thing that I totally glazed over the first time I saw this card. Everyone automatically thinks, okay, well, I'll pay a bunch of zero mana spells, get my commander out really quick and then attack. Sure. But how many times are you going to be able to do that in a game? right? I thought if we can do it on an opponent's turn, it might be better, right? So if you have a Vidalcan Ori out, obviously you can cast your commander with Flash. So you have your commander sitting in your command zone. Your opponent cast a couple spells in their turn. And I think if they even cast two spells, now your commander costs six. That's pretty good. Definitely a seven, seven trample haste for six is pretty good. It is an option for you to get it out. You know, doesn't necessarily have to be on your turn. The downside there is it's not going to have the hex proof on your turn. So it's a sort of a bit of a trade-off. Yeva, Nature's Herald is another way you can do this, right? Casting your green creatures with flash. I mean, casting stuff at instant speed is always going to be good, right? So these cards are going to be a big advantage for you no matter what green deck you're playing. So why not throw them in here as well? Savage Summoning is one that I would think works particularly good. One green mana instant. Savage Summoning can't be countered. Everyone loves seeing that on a card. The next creature spell you cast this turn can be cast as though it had flash. That spell can't be countered and that creature enters the battlefield with an additional plus one, plus one counter on it. So everything that's happening here is fantastic. So again, your opponent cast two spells on their turn. We're on their end step. We cast Savage Summoning. That's one mana. So that's another spell that's been cast this turn. So now we're up to three. That has now reduced our commander's casting cost by nine. So now it only costs three mana. Of course, we have to cast the Savage Summoning. So that's four mana total, but that's not a big deal. In a green deck, you can get to four mana on turn three easily. And it's going to have a plus one, plus one counter on it. So it's going to be an eight, eight, which is even more of an added bonus. So that's a great fit, I think. Of course, we have to do the Voltron. You know, I think the big thing here is protecting your commander. It has Hexproof. The first turn it was cast, but that's about it. I love Steely Resolve here. Obviously, this is one of my go-tos for protecting my commander. And I like the fact that it gives that shroud as soon as your commander hits the table. You'll obviously have to name Dinosaur when you play it. Guardian Augmenter is another one that we can play beforehand, right? It's going to be sitting on the table. And again, it's got Flash, so it plays into that theme as well. Our commander gets that plus two, plus two bump. So now it's a nine, nine and has Hexproof. So when we cast it, it's just going to have Hexproof automatically. I mean, it has Hexproof as soon as it's the table, but if we cast it with Flash, it won't have it on our turn unless we have our Guardian Augmenter out. Slippery Bog Bonder is another way we can do this. Three and a green. Three, three Human Druid with Flash. Again with the Flash. So you could go a little bit of that theme here. Has Hexproof itself, and when Slippery Bog Bonder enters the battlefield, put a Hexproof counter on target creature. Then move any number of counters from among creatures you control onto that creature.
creatures. So if we have any other creatures around with plus one, plus one counters on them, maybe we can move those around. The hexproof counter obviously is the most important part here. And again, once we put that counter on our commander, the slippery bog bonder gets killed. We don't care. We got the hexproof. We got what we wanted. Of course, lightning greaves will look great here. Basilisk collar is also fantastic here. Death touch is particularly good with trample because when you're getting in for damage, your opponent throws like a 3-3 three, three creature in the way. You don't have to deal it three damage. You only have to deal as much damage to kill a creature and then you trample over. And with death touch, you only have to deal one damage to kill a creature, right? So you just assign one damage to that creature, no matter how big the creature is. Even if it's a 10-10, you only have to assign one damage to that creature if you have death touch on your trampling creature and then whatever's left over tramples over. So you're always going to be doing at least six commander damage if you have death touch on your Thrasta, which is great. Obviously, you can go the route of, I got a bunch of zero mana things and, you know, you could do a very expensive version of this deck with Mana Crypt and Mox Amber and all these zero mana artifacts. The only downside here is you're just going to get this really explosive start and then you're going to empty your hand. You're going to be a target for sure. Like you're just making yourself the arch enemy right out of the gate, which for me again, personally, as I say all the time, is not a great strategy. You could do that. You know, I think definitely a Mox Amber could probably fit in this deck for sure because you're probably going to have your commander out pretty quickly. Probably a better way to go is the zero mana equipment artifacts, right? Like Cathar's Shield, Bone Saw, because you're casting them to make your commander cheaper, but then you can also equip them to your commander. So it's win-win there, right? You could also do with stuff like Bribery's Purse and Astral Cornucopia. I mean, you're going to need a mana rock in your deck anyway, probably. Why not put Astral Cornucopia in there? Sure, we can cast it for three mana and it'll tap for one. We can cast it for six mana, it'll tap for two. Or we can just cast it for zero mana. You don't have to pay anything in Astral Cornucopia. It'll enter the battlefield. You won't be able to tap it for mana, but it is a free spell that'll make our commander cheaper. Bribery's Purse is another one, right? Any of these artifacts that have X in their casting cost, you can put mana into them if you got extra mana lying around, or you can just pay the zero because it'll make your commander three cheaper, right? Since we're probably going to be in a bit of an artifact theme, you could even go with stuff like Arcbound Ravager, Ingenuity Engine. You're going to have a lot of those zero mana, like you cast your Bribery's Purse for zero. Now it's just sitting there doing nothing. Now we can actually sacrifice it and get some value out of it. So you could go a, sort of a neat little niche way with this where you are in a sacrifice artifact theme because you're probably going to have a lot of zero drop artifacts just lying around that you're not really doing anything with. Of course, KCI works great here as well. You sacrifice it for mana. So that's an extra great fit here where your, your commander, now you can cast that Cathar's Shield. That's going to reduce your commander by three. Then you can sacrifice the Cathar's Shield to add two to cast your commander. So it's going to work in both situations. Scrapyard Recombiner is another interesting one right? Three mana, zero, zero construct has modular two. So of course it's going to enter the battlefield with two counters on it. You can tap it to sacrifice an artifact to search your library for a construct card revealed and put it in your hand. This is kind of a funny one because again, we're going to have lots of these artifacts around that we can sacrifice. That's not going to be an issue, but you can go get a Mem Knight, which is a construct or a hanger back walker, which is a construct or a walking ballista, which is a construct, right? Those are three constructs that essentially cost zero mana. Now, obviously, if you cast your walking ballista for zero, it'll die right away, but it is a spell. You've cast it. That's going to reduce your commander's casting cost. So Scrapyard Recombiner is actually a great fit here where it's going to sit on the battlefield and all we have to do is just sack an artifact that we're not using anyway. Go get a essentially a zero mana artifact that we can then cast. It'll reduce the cost of our commander. You could throw Inquisitive Puppet in here, Iron Apprentice. They're one mana constructs and they'll give us a little bit of value, right? Inquisitive Puppet will let us scry one and then once it enters the battlefield, we can exile it to make a 1-1 human creature token. Why not? I'm always trying to find a way to fit this into decks for some reason. Iron Apprentice enters the battlefield with a counter on it and when it dies, so obviously we have those sacrifice effects, we can sacrifice it. You can put the plus one, plus one counter onto your commander if you want, so that's a great fit there as well. So that's another interesting theme you could do rather than just, I get my commander out really fast and start hitting my opponents with it. I mean, that's probably your win con, but the sacrifice artifact theme I think is a really fun fit there with Thrasta if you want to do something a little different. But coming in at number one this week and this one is a big surprise is Parage of Urborg and it's funny because I was actually thinking of making this deck a couple months back I was looking for a new mono black deck to make I decided to go with another one instead but obviously I had already done a ton of research for this one so it made it a lot easier and it's one of those commanders that you look at and you go oh it's not very good it's kind of boring there's not a lot going on but there actually is quite 
a bit if you start doing some research on it and I will get to that. So three black black cat warrior two three. So obviously five mana two three is terrible. Has first strike when it's attacking. So that's not bad. Whenever a player cast a black spell, you may pay a black. If you do put a plus one plus one counter on Paraj of Urborg. So that is of course when any player casts a black spell. And since you're in a mono black deck, you're going to be doing that all the time. But if you have opponents that are playing black, you might want to leave some mana open, right? Because whenever they cast a black spell, you can pay that black and put a counter on your commander. And of course, this is going to be a Voltron strategy. In fact, even more so than the Thrasta deck, possibly. That's the way I went anyway, because there is a lot you can do here. And as I say all the time, whenever you're building with an underwhelming commander, always be checking that creature type. And our commander is a cat and a warrior. Now, the only cat tribal stuff in a mono black deck is Animal Sanctuary that I could find. Typically, you're not doing cat tribal in black, but Animal Sanctuary, you can pay two to put a plus one, plus one counter on target. Bird, cat, dog, goat, ox, or snake. Of course, cat is the one we care about. So this puts plus one, plus one counters on our commander. And we're already doing a plus one, plus one counter theme here already, right? So that really does fit well. The warrior thing more so, we got Mind Blade Render and Raider's Spoils. Both fantastic fits here because our commander is a warrior. Mind Blade Render, whenever a warrior deals damage to an opponent, you draw a card and you lose one life. So that's a great fit. And Raider's Spoils, same thing. Whenever a warrior you control deals combat damage to a player, you may pay one life if you do draw a card. Also, creatures you control get plus one, plus oh, that also fits with what we're doing. Blood Chin Fanatics, another great one here. One black, black, orc warrior, three, three. Pay one and a black, sacrifice another warrior creature, target player loses X life, and you gain X life for X is the sacrifice creature's power. So obviously, we're not going to want to do this on our commander unless it's probably going to die anyway. We can use it as a finishing blow if we want. Our commander is going to keep getting bigger and bigger and bigger. It's going to become a target. If we have our Blood Chin Fanatic on the battlefield, you're going to want to make sure to leave that two mana open because as soon as our opponent casts that swords to get rid of our commander in response, we will sacrifice it, hit them for a whole ton of damage, and we'll get it to gain a bunch of life. So I think that's a great fit. Obsidian Battle Axe is another good fit here. Three mana warrior equipment. Equip creature gets plus two, plus one, and has haste. And whenever a warrior creature enters the battlefield, you may attach Obsidian Battle Axe to it. So we don't have to pay that three equip cost. We'll play our commander. This will automatically fit onto it. It's now, even without any plus one, plus one counters, it's now a 4-4, four, four, and it has haste so we can attack right away, so I think that's a great fit. The plus one, plus one counter theme as well we can do here, and again, there's a lot of support for that. Hager Constrictor gives each creature we control with a plus one, plus one counter on it. Menace, Mare Ek Nightblade is going to give our plus one, plus one counter creatures Death Touch, which works extra good with First Strike, right? Because we're going to deal our damage first when we're attacking, so it's going to kill the creature that's blocking us before we take any damage. Skyclave Shadow Cat and Nikara Lair Scavenger both work great here because they'll allow us to draw cards when our commander die or any other creature that we have plus one plus one counters on it. Skyclave Shadowcat cares specifically about plus one plus one counters. Nikara cares about any kind of counter but typically that's going to be a plus one plus one counter in this deck. Feast on the Fallen is just such a fantastic card that you know I should have mentioned this in my 10 cards video. I think it's great. Two and a black enchantment. At the beginning of each upkeep if an opponent lost life last turn pull a plus one plus one counter on target creature you control so we're going to be putting that on our commander likely and this is almost every upkeep I find when I use this card like your opponent cracks a fetch land on their turn they've now lost life that turn so on the next upkeep you get to put a counter on your commander and then of course on your turn you're going to be attacking you're going to be doing damage so on the next upkeep you're guaranteed going to be getting that just really great card I think of course the Ozolith ha it has to go in this deck we're dealing with plus one plus one counters when our commander dies if it dies we don't want to lose them retribution of the ancients is another fantastic fit here one black mana in enchantment we can pay black and remove x plus one plus one counters from among creatures we control to give target creature minus x minus x until end of turn so we don't typically want to be removing those counters from our commander but again this is more of a situation where if our commander is going to die anyway we can remove those counters to kill someone else's creatures blood tracker is just a fantastic fit here again we're in the plus one plus one counter theme so why not throw a few more creatures in there like that we can even use feast on the fallen or some of these other effects to pile counters on this as well we don't necessarily have to put them on our commander. I really like Phyrexian Scriptures in a Voltron deck in black. It is sort of a pseudo Dune Blast in a way where it can be a, a sort of a one-sided board wipe, right? Two black, black, Enchantment Saga, Chapter 1, put a plus one, plus one counter on up to one target creature, so that's fitting everything we're doing already. That creature becomes an artifact in addition to his other types, which isn't great because it makes our commander easier to kill, but the next chapter, destroy all non-artifact creatures, so assuming our opponents don't have any artifact creatures, which usually 
usually they don't. It's just going to destroy every creature except for our commander, which is great. And then, of course, Chapter 3 is exile all your opponent's graveyards, which that's always good, too. So great fit in the deck. I also have those slingshot effects like Fane, Death, and Undying Malice because Black's not great at protecting your creatures. So that, you know, a Voltron strategy is tough to do in Black, but... We do have the slingshot effects where if our commander dies, we can pay the one black mana. It'll come back into play. And as an added bonus, it's going to get a plus one, plus one counter on it. So we're starting off on the right foot. I also got Oblivion's Hunger and Professor's Warning. Oblivion's Hunger, one in a black instant target creature you control gains indestructible until end of turn. So that's great protection for our commander. Draw a card if that creature had a plus one, plus one counter on it. So we're probably going to get a card draw off this as well. Professor's Warning is a one black instant that is modal. We can either put a counter on our commander if we want to or we can make target creature indestructible in a turn so of course both of those things we want to be doing in this deck and then i decided to try out one of my 10 deck ideas in this deck i talked about that in my recent 10 deck ideas video about deadly wanderings and homicidal seclusion both five mana enchantments that if you control exactly one creature they give you a bonus we only have 13 creatures in this deck that's not a lot it is likely that we're going to have just our commander on the battlefield and not others so i thought these would be good fits right deadly wanderings if our commander is the only creature it's going to get plus two plus oh and have death touch and lifelink that's pretty fantastic and again the death touch fits really really well with the first strike and homicidal seclusion if our commander is the only creature it's going to get plus three plus one and have lifelink so i thought give those a try in the deck you know if we have another creature in play and we might it'll shut these effects off temporarily and then if we lose one of our creatures we'll get it turned on back again i also put altar of the goif in the deck again another card i mentioned in that video even though we might have another creature we probably are going to only be attacking with our commander so these kinds of effects whenever you attack with one creature the exalted effects work here as well so whenever we attack with our commander alone it's going to get plus x plus x until end of turn where x is the number of cards card types among cards in all graveyards so that's a nice little boost reaper's talisman is also another one that fits nicely here one black mana equipment whenever equipped creature attacks it gains death touch in a turn and again the first strike and death touch work really really well together but also when a crypt creature attacks alone defending player loses two life and you gain two life so i think that's a great fit as well pretty neat little deck i put together here i think you know i, I kind of wish that parage didn't cost five that's a lot for a two three it's kind of nice to get your commander out a little earlier so you can get going with it and, and start paying the black mana to put the counters on it but you know in a way it's kind of can be good to set up your board first so that when your commander finally gets out you have all the protections ready to go you have all the equipment and the card draw and all that ready to go you know the way i would play this deck is do some setup first so that when your commander hits the table and your commander is not going to be a target no one's going to look at your parade and go oh my gosh get it off the table right away but it eventually might get there right once you start piling those counters on your commander it is going to become a target but then you're going to have sort of the other stuff around to protect your commander with i think but there it is that is parage of urborg the deck list of course is in the description below for anyone who wants to check it out also in the description below is the poll for the next underwhelming commanders video go vote and see which commander will be in the next video in this series but that is it for today and thanks for tuning in